Hello, everybody, and welcome tonight to this forum. When I read the title, What Does, One, what Does Plan Bay Area Mean to Moran, I thought, ooh, I hope people come because this might be boring, but I, apparently not, so I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, the sponsors tonight, the League of Women Voters, the Environmental Housing Collaborative, Marin Conservation League, Sustainable San Rafael, Sustainable Marin, is, an, is an, a lo their long-time organizations that have worked in Marin County, and I think that you're going to have a good evening with them because they're going to give you the facts, they're going to clear up any misinformation or questions that you may have, and I think I want to thank all of the sponsors for, for having this tonight. Um, I'm glad it's being taped, so be sure and smile when you talk. And I'm glad it's being taped because um, I have to go and make a quorum at LAFCO because they're voting on the budget tonight, so I'll be eager to watch the tape when it's over. So I'm now going to introduce the moderator for tonight. She is a colleague of mine, Katie Rice. And you might think that she looks really nice and sweet, but I can tell you she's really tough. So be nice to her, mind your manners, and I'm going to turn this over to Katie, and thank you all. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. I've got a couple more housekeeping items. Cell phones off or on silent. That's, a, that's an easy one now. And then also, um, as Judy said, this event is being televised and we have, um, I wanted to give you the dates. Um, it is gonna be broadcast this Sunday, May 12th at 8 p.m. on Comcast Channel 30 and AT&T AT uh, Channel 99. And then it will also be broadcast on Channel 26 um, as at, over the next several months, I'm sure, on a recurring cycle. So. I believe um, it'll, the information will be posted also on the websites of these very, various organizations. Um, I wanted to also um, do a, a big call out and thank you uh, to Dr. Denise Lucy and the Dominican University Institute for Leadership Studies uh, for allowing us to be here tonight for hosting this event. They've been an, a wonderful community partner, um, many, many community events here on the campus that allow um, the citizenry to become much more informed and involved in the discussions that, that go on in this community on a number of topics. Uh, this is the third in a series of public forums since 2011 put on by these Marin community organizations. They are aimed at engaging the broader community in discussing local and regional planning. To all of you who made it here tonight, I thank you for coming. Your presence and your participation is the ultimate demonstration of civic engagement and is vitally important. So my hat off to you for taking the time to be here. As you know, tonight's forum is focused on Plan Bay Area, what it is and what it isn't, how its adoption may affect Marin County. It's an opportunity to better understand Plan Bay Area, to identify concerns as well as potential benefits to ask questions, and to provide a forum for expressing different viewpoints and opinions. Planning is important, but no plan is perfect, and Plan Bay Area is no exception. From the level of analysis around sea level rise, to questions about population and job growth projections, to concerns about sources of financing for the public infrastructure and services necessary to support growth. These are just some of the concerns that have been raised so far in response to Plan Bay Area. At the same time, there is broad acknowledgement of our need to plan for the future at both the local and regional level, and to address these key questions as well as many others. We hope that this evening's presentation and ensuing discussion will help inform and encourage a thoughtful community conversation about not only Plan Bay Area, but also environmental, equity, and climate solutions for Marin and the region as together we plan for the future. So I want to go over the format of the evening. We're going to start out with um, panel presentations, 
each of, each of these folks who have volunteered their time and their expertise to come being here tonight um, will cover um, a special area. There'll be 10 minutes each, and I'm going to hold them to that because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions and answers and, and Q&A or comments at the end. So following the presentations, we'll do Q&A. It'll be in, um, I want to use question cards. Uh, they'll be circulated around the audience. If you have a card, fill it out at, if, fill it out at any time. Hold your hand up. There'll be runners to pick up cards. Um, try to keep your question as specific as possible. And um, we will try, the panel will, will try to get to all the questions that are handed in, but um, I'm guessing some will be focused in, in certain areas, so we may take a representative question when we have categories that seem to, um, to focus on a general topic. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce our panel and get going on the panel presentations. Whoop. I'm getting my list of, of who everybody is. All right, so Linda Jackson from Transportation Authority of Marin Planning Manager is going to, her subject matter is, what is Plan Bay Area? Chantelle Walker from uh, the Marin Community Development Agency is going to speak to what does it mean for housing and equity in Marin? Michelle Rodriguez, raise your hand, Michelle, uh, is the, a former principal planner for um, the county of Marin and worked on the countywide plan, and her subject matter is what does it mean for climate action in Marin. And Marge Macris, second from the end there, uh, co-chair of the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative will speak to the impact or effect on Marin's environment. And finally, Dave Edmondson, the author of The Greater Marin, will speak about Marin traditions and models for transit-oriented communities. So let's um, give Linda Jacks a big hand and invite her on up. Thank you. I'm honored to be part of this evening and to be here with you to talk about Plan Bay Area in 10 minutes. I do a call out now to my planning colleagues who've been with me on this journey of trying to understand Plan Bay Area. You know, every time my daughter comes home from Oklahoma, she says, Mom, it sure is pretty here. It sure is pretty in Marin. I don't know why she didn't notice that when she was growing up. Planning, regional planning is not new in the Bay Area. It started after World War II. Regional agencies were set up to deal with water pollution, air pollution, jurisdiction, jurisdictional collaborations, fill in the Bay, and funding transportation improvements. I'm going to be talking about this context, history, and the components of Plan Bay Area. Marin? has 11 distinct communities and a number of West Marin communities. They were all built in a time before the car, and what tied them together at that time was a railroad. This historic pattern was preserved with the countywide plan over the last 40 years with four corridors. Uh, there's the coastal corridor, there's the inland corridor. Oh, no, there we go, wrong one. Inland corridor, the city center corridor, and then the Baylands corridor. This planning has preserved Marin to be the pretty place that it is today. So what's the driver for Plan Bay Area? It's the Assembly Bill 32, adopted 2006, and it requires that California reduce its greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2020. There are a number of components to the plan. Whoops, back up. Another components to AB 32. Um, we're going to be talking about the sustainable community strategy component in red at the top. AB 32 begat Senate Bill 375, which calls for the preparation of regional plans across the state of California, with the goal that each plan achieve a 15% per capita, that's per person, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from cars and small trucks. There are three parts to this plan. 
Number one is the regional transportation plan. That's been ongoing for decades in, in, this, in every region. Number two is adding in a sustainable community strategy. That's the land use plan. And number three is folding in a housing program of the state. It's called the Regional Housing Needs Allocation Program. I'll walk you through those components in the plan. The approach in the region is similar to what we've done in Marin. Focus our communities in the right areas and preserve our natural and our ag lands. To achieve the targets of greenhouse gas reduction, Plan Bay Area pairs up future growth with transportation investments. It's built around the pre premise that to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from cars and trucks, you need to have less driving. So in order to have less driving, the land use plan envisions that as businesses grow, people come here to work, our children grow up, that growth will be within the urban footprint, which is in the dark gray on the slide. Jurisdictions were invited to apply for an ABAG designation called Priority Development Area. That's called PDA for short, not Public Display of Affection. For communities that have the potential for growth and thus a need for prioritization for, to receive transportation funding. And the, oh, back up again. The PDAs in the Bay Area are shown in dark blue. There are three PDAs in Marin County. There are two planned PDAs. These are PDAs that have the general plan and the zoning uh, regulations in place. They are at the smart stations, future smart stations in San Rafael, downtown in the Civic Center. There is one planned PDA, or potential PDA, and that is in the county areas of jurisdiction along the 101 city corridor. There are six neighborhoods in that PDA, but the zoning and the general plan in, that, in the, that PDA, the potential PDA, are not in place yet. Also on this map are 15 priority conservation areas. They're shown in these little trees with the white circles. There's 15 of them in the, in the Bay Area, in Marin, and they're scheduled for funding for preservation of ag lands and open space. So let's look at how the forecasts um, are for Marin County compared to the Bay Area. ABAG's forecasts are for strong jobs growth to 2040 for the Bay Area because as a region we are well positioned economically to grow as a nation grows in healthcare, education, hospitality, high tech. These are sectors of growth and that's where the Bay Area is strong. You see that in Santa Clara County, they're projecting a lot of growth, that's the most. But Marin County is projected to have about half of what the rest of the Bay Area was, primarily because we explained a year ago that this was, we do not anticipate the same rate of growth as the rest of the Bay Area. Let's look at how that forecast does with the past. So this is the past 30 years of jobs growth in, in Marin, and here's looking ahead the next 30 years. I want to point out that all those new jobs are not going in new buildings. They are going to fill up first the vacant buildings. Now, let's talk about household growth. This is the estimate of growth for the, house, for the Bay Area. This is Santa Clara County, which will have the most. And this is Marin County, much slower rate for the Bay, uh, than the Bay Area, about half. Let's see how we did the last 30 years. That was in Marin, the last 30 years, going forward, about half. I have one more topic about housing, and that's the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, called RENA. This is a program of the state that's been around for over 30 years for local planning for housing needs. This regional amount, the state gives regional agencies an estimate of what the housing need is for that, the whole region, and then the regional agency will distribute it out to local jurisdictions, and that forms the basis for community discussions about their housing policies. That was our 
Marin's regional housing need in 1999 to 2006 planning period went down for the one that we're in right now, and the draft number is half that. This slide compares Marin's RENA with the other eight Bay Area counties. In the current cycle, our housing need is 2.3%. Oh, there we go again. Sorry. 2.3%, and it's projected to be 1.2%. You can see looking in the right-hand column how Plan Bay Area plays out for the Bay Area. Some counties are projected to grow. The inner counties, Alameda, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara. The outer counties are not. So you'll recall the 15% reduction in per capita greenhouse emissions. 9% is from land use, 6.6% is from transportation. Most of transportation funding is what's called committed, and most of it is going to a policy called fix it first. It's maintenance, take care of what you have. But there is money, that's a little sliver there, but it's what is going to go toward achieving that final amount um, of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. I also want to note the Bay Area, one Bay Area grant program where discretionary money did come to TAM. That money was allocated to um, local jurisdictions here for transportation improvements. Half of it had to go for um, the PDAs. I want to note that there was an EIR prepared, an environmental impact report prepared for Plan Bay Area. That is what's under review right now. And there were five alternatives, including the plan, and these are just three of the targets that were studied. The Plan Bay Area provides, or the EIR provides an opportunity to see if there are better ways to deal with the, the environmental impacts. There was also an equity analysis provided as well. One of the questions is about local control. And local control, when this plan was, oh, in SB 375, it was being written in 2008, local control was a big issue for all of your city council members. And the League of California Cities embedded in the law this clause, nothing in the sustainable uh, strategy supersedes the land use authority of cities. And nothing requires a city to comply with the regional plan. And I'll end with this slide. These are the four objectives of Plan Bay Area. Complete com com communities. I would submit that Marin is a model for that objective. The one about housing, I'd say that I'd note there's one issue that's in common to all of our communities, and I think we'll be engaging in how to address the needs of our aging uh, population. Number three, economy. If we haven't learned anything in the last five years, it's the importance of having a viable, strong economy. And finally, we must protect our unique natural environment for those who come after us. Thank you. Next, we have Chantelle Walker. Um, she is the Social Equity and Policy and Programs Coordinator for the Marin Community, Development Ag De Marin Community Development Agency, and she will speak on what does it mean for housing, what does Plan Bay Area mean for housing and equity in Marin? Thank you, Chantelle. Thank you, Supervisor. Good evening. It's good to be with you. So what I'll talk about tonight is something that I hope many of you have heard and thought about in the past. Marin and social equity, it's one of our values. It's also part of our public policy. Many of you will remember, I hope, that our general plan focuses on the environment, equity, and the economy. We have done quite well in many areas. Few communities have the strength that we have in the environment. Few communities have the strength that we have in the economy almost anywhere in the nation on a per capita income basis or wealth basis has the economy and the economic strength that we have. Equity is a goal. Equity is a place that we're growing in strength as a community. And this plan, this planning process, regional integration and alignment, simply offers us another opportunity at strength, at alignment, and to reinforce the values of our community. Marin is unique. 
We talk about that often. Marin is also interdependent, interdependent in the Bay Area, interdependent upon its communities, interdependent for its successes. As we look at environmental sustainability and preservation, the interdependence of our communities was always highlighted. As we look at our economy, those who work here in Marin, those who live here and work in other parts of the Bay Area, we take that into account. As we look at social equity or the lens of social equity, on occasion I've had conversations and folks have said, so what do you mean by that? Well, social equity is defined as an evolving condition where public policy as well as community practices assure that all community members have access to institutional resources, the things that we share, as well as have the opportunity to realize and access full participation and potential. This plan, why would it be useful for equity? Well, in Marin, it's important because its outcomes will work to ease things that are important to us, the severe mismatch between our housing needs and our housing demand. A population that many may be familiar with, we are an aging population in Marin County in faster numbers than many other parts of the Bay Area and in other parts of our community. Many seniors who've worked hard and lived here, continue to be contributors in our community, are now burdened with large homes. Those homes are sometimes hard to maintain, but their choices are often few. Move from the community that you know, move from the people that you know, to find an affordable place to live. Or maybe their children are not able to live here, or their grandchildren are not able to live here. Communities, will have access to creating a better match. And it's local, local decision making, as Linda mentioned, a better match between need and demand. In addition, Marin has been working on, and we have more work to do, fair housing and equal access in housing. Many of us, as a value, believe and support equal access in housing. We realize that discrimination in housing transactions is against the law, and very few people favor that. But very few know that a 2009 study of Marin actually showed patterns of housing transaction discrimination. This plan allows us to align our values with our planning, with strong implementation. So, for example, it was found in this study that landlords often guided people to communities based on their race or ethnicity. It was found that upper and middle income people of color often felt unwelcomed or were guided to communities that were um, below their economic means simply because of race. That large families had trouble accessing rental properties. That the disabled were often being churned out of property. Few in this room or many rooms would support that. We need opportunities to address it. The alignment of our values and our goals can in part be realized in this plan. No plan is perfect and towards the end I'll talk a little bit about some things that we might think about differently. However, this plan is strong. Plan Bay Area offers the opportunity to work actively on our current goals, support things like fair housing choice, and points to some broader equity focuses. It's a long-term transportation and land use plan. It also helps us support our workforce, the higher income portions of our workforce, the middle income portions of our workforce, and the lower income portions of our workforce. It focuses on reducing vehicle emissions. This helps us maintain the strength that we've created over decades in our county. It, again, aligns and recognizes our interdependence. And will, upon implementation, and certainly it's a projection and not a final, but upon implementation, help us better match supply and demand. It does have performance measures, so in many cases, we'll be able to look, reflect, and refine how we've moved forward. And equity in this planning process, this is a seminal moment, is integrated and has measures so that our community can have a concrete conversation. It recognizes our job growth, the 
It only projects our housing growth at less than half of that, the nine and sometimes the 9% that was mentioned. And in terms of our regional interdependence, 98% of housing goes other places. Only 1.2% of the housing allocation is in our community, companion to our 17% job growth. There are many strengths to this plan. The draft plan puts billions of dollars into running transit, both maintenance but new opportunities. Environmental and equity groups have had many and deep refining conversations about this plan, but we do see strengths. There are always questions, questions that remain about a plan. Would the plan be strengthened if there were, say, 5% more housing near transportation? That's a community question. Would the plan be strengthened with additional funds into routes and operations? Those are good questions, but this is also a strong plan. I encourage you, as you evaluate it and its merits, to consider what it brings to us around equity and around housing, how it matches our community's character, and how we can support the best of the plan, which every several years will be updated and refined. Be a part of that process. Thank you. Thank you, Chantel. And now I'd like to introduce Michelle Rodriguez, former principal planner for the Marin uh, Countywide Plan. And she will speak on the topic, what does Plan Bay Area mean for climate action in Marin? Welcome, Michelle. So global climate change poses an immediate threat to the Bay Area's economy, the environment, and public health. And we understand that there is a potential for significant adverse effects in terms of our water supply, infrastructure, agriculture, ecosystems and biodiversity, energy demand, supply and transmission, as well as public health. And in Marin County, we conducted a countywide emissions analysis and we understand that in 2005, 62% of the emissions were contributed from transportation, while 31% was from commercial and residential building, heating, and cooling. So this plan is directly focused on that larger transportation emissions contribution. So how is climate action planning addressed locally? All jurisdictions in Marin County have performed their emissions inventory, and eight out of 12 of those jurisdictions have finalized and adopted a community climate action plan, which documents their contribution to emissions and identifies strategies for greenhouse gas reductions. Planned Bay Area, as I mentioned, is transportation focused, and so these local climate action plans will continue to be relied upon not only for other contributions regarding transportation, but also for those building energy reductions, waste, and agricultural contributions. So transportation in Marin, this is a complicated subject in that transportation systems contribute to climate change primarily through the emissions of certain greenhouse gases from non-renewable energy sources, primarily gasoline and diesel fuels used to operate passenger, commercial, and transit vehicles. And why I mentioned it's somewhat uh, difficult is that we have a significant amount of pass-through traffic moving from one county to another passing through Marin, and over half of our working population are employed in professional management and financial business occupations. So most of these workers are employed outside the county in urban centers such as Oakland and San Francisco. So over half of them are traveling outside of our county for AM and PM times. Also, during the daytime, we have a significant amount of in-commuting of employees for services, construction, and transportation industries. Additionally, we have a significant amount of weekend uh, folks who are coming in to visit our beautiful open space, our parks, and beaches. So regarding Plan Bay Area and greenhouse gases, 
The plan was mandated to meet a minimum reduction of a per capita CO2 emission reduction for cars and light duty trucks by a minimum of 15% by 2040. There is a plan and five alternatives. I'll be speaking about the plan this evening, but we can speak about the alternatives later if you'd like. But regarding the plan, they are estimating that they will be achieving a 16.4% reduction in per capita CO2 emission reduction with the proposed plan. So there is in the plan a 28-year revenue forecast projection of $289 billion. They estimate that if they apply this funding for the emission reduction for cars and light-duty trucks, they will achieve this reduction in three ways, through multimodal transportation network, a focused land use plan, and investment in te technological advancements and incentives. The funding is a combination of committed and discretionary funding. So regarding the focused land use plan, $10 million of those funds will be given to the Congestion Management Agency, and they must direct 50% of that in the PDAs. What I'd like to see is there's $320 million of funding that's distributed region-wide. I'd like to see these funds competitive and open to any project of merit. The first round of funding also directs an additional $20 million, $10 million of it for financing workforce housing projects and to support priority conservation area projects for farm to market or for purchasing conservation lands. I'd like to see this funding regarding workforce housing ongoing for uh, funding feasibility studies, project specific stakeholder meetings, or to fill gap funding for housing. Regarding the priority conservation areas, I'd like to see this funding available for participation in the Joint Policy Committee's adaptation effort or local reclamation and adaptation projects. The plan includes $640 million of climate initiatives that are transportation focused. Interesting, interestingly enough, the $640 million will result in 40% of the projected per capita CO2 emissions reduction by 2030 with less than a 2% investment. I'd like to see an increased investment in this area over time. Um, particularly focusing on any particular effective climate strategies. There is an additional uh, $33 million in climate initiatives called the Innovative Grants Pilot Showcase Projects, and I think Marin should compete aggressively for them. I think one area that needs to be addressed here is the issue of attribution. Each um, there will be many climate-related projects that will occur in and around Fort Marin County, and I think early on we need to agree and have a communication with the regional agencies about attribution for those projects as it relates to our Climate Action Plan. Regarding natural systems and climate action, I think there are a number of impacts that we can anticipate. Sea level rise, flooding and landslides, water supply, air quality, biology and wetlands, wild wildflower, wildfire or emergency planning, agriculture and food production, and public utilities. I think the plan does acknowledge sea level rise by 2010 being 55 inches and it does reference the California Climate Adaptation Strategy as well as the Joint Policy Committee, Bay Area Climate and Energy Resilience Strategy. The plan does acknowledge that 32 projects will be exposed to mid-century sea level rise inundation. However, I have a question about something mentioned in the plan, and that is that Caltrans directs projects with a life that extends to 2030 or earlier, not to assume in its environmental impact analysis impacts from sea level rise. So I think that that, that interim guidance from Cal, Caltrans needs to be revisited. Regarding flooding and wetlands, 
Wetlands plays an important role as storage areas for storm and flood waters, water recharge, filtration, and purification functions. I'd love to see Marin uh, seek funding for additional flood and shoreline protection. I think we need to assure that the current FEMA flood map updates that are currently underway reflect any current science that we have on the sea level rise high water mark. And I believe that Marin needs to complete a spe Marin specific strategic resilience and adaptation plan by compiling the Marin specific climate science and studies and we need to prioritize our actions, identify funding needs, and create a timeline for project implementation. Regarding air quality, the negative effects of climate change on air quality in the, in the Bay Area is considered to be significant and will impact public health, largely from increasing levels of ozone and fine particulate matter the plan indicates that the impact will be significant and unavoidable, so there will be specific site and design requirements. Regarding agriculture and food production, there will be changes in temperature, more extreme heat days, earlier onset of spring, which will create suboptimal growing conditions, which can impact agriculture and food availability our local economy and tourism. The plan does acknowledge agriculture from the standpoint of conversion of lands to the built environment, but it does not address the combined impacts to agricultural lands from the project due to increases in vehicle miles traveled or PM10 to our economic viability, agricultural production, or the local economy. There are two remaining issues regarding the built environment that I'd like to address, energy and water supply. Energy reliability, affordability, and environmental responsibility in terms of resources is critical, and I think the Marin Energy Authority is doing an excellent job of focusing on exceeding the renewables for polio, uh, portfolio standard and going towards zero net energy. And I think that we need to continue to focus on Marin being energy independent. But I do think that when you look at the plan and you look at other jurisdiction, there is opportunity for um, providing language for all jurisdictions in the region to focus on energy conservation, green building, green business, energy efficiency, to try to offset the planned greenhouse gas contributions. Locally, Marin could consider ordinances to require solar and new construction. And then finally, regarding water supply, the plan is doing an indicates that it will result in an insufficient water supplies for existing entitlements and resources to serve expected development. What it does is it expects existing conditions to remain. It does not take into account dry years or overwatered years due to climate change, and I think that they need to account for this. Also, the baseline is 2010 to 2030. They don't extend all the way to 2040, and I think they do need to analyze water availability for 2040 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I want to remind folks that if yeah, there's um, Kiki's going up and down the aisles here, if you have a question, fill out a question card, or if you need a question card, raise, raise your hand and um, she'll bring you one. So next I'd like to introduce Marge Mackers uh, from the formal, former, uh, excuse me, co-chair of the Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative, and she will be speaking on what Plan Bay Area means for Marin's environment. Welcome, Marge. Thank you, good evening. What does Plan Bay Area mean for Marin's environment? Uh, first of all, I think we need to recognize that Plan Bay Area is not talking about a lot of weird new ideas, that these, the basic principles that it's talking about have been part of Marin County's planning for 
40 years. And I was one of the people that actually worked on the 1973 countywide plan, so I'm one of those um, older Marin residents that might be looking for a somewhat smaller place to live. Um, but a basic principle of the Marin Countywide Plan in establishing the environmental corridors that Linda described was that uh, development should be focused in the city centered corridor in areas that have transportation and other services rather than sprawling out into the open space and agricultural lands. Another basic principle of the countywide plan, and these principles have continued in the subsequent revisions of the document, is that there are, in fact, limits to growth based on environmental constraints, that, that development has to take place within environmental constraints, which determine how much growth we can actually accommodate. Uh, that is what determines how much growth we project in our plans, uh, rather than um, economic projections that don't often take into account these, these factors. Um, the city plans, uh, are, have been generally consistent with these ideas as well for the past several decades. And the cities uh, and, and the county have adopted climate action plans, which actually uh, also uh, recommend that growth be focused in areas that have transportation and other services rather than sprawling as a means of, of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by reducing the vehicle miles traveled. The, uh, Plan Bay Area projects the lowest rate of growth for any of the nine, for Marin of any of the nine Bay, Bay Area counties, 13 percent for population, 17 percent for jobs. The population housing projections are higher than that in the 2007 countywide plan, which takes into account all the growth in the cities as well as the county. Uh, it's higher for the uh, Bay, Plan Bay Area is higher for population because of uh, ways the projections were done, and I know there's been some checking into that about why there's an apparent discrepancy between um, the Plan Bay Area projections and those of the State Department of Finance, and maybe we can get into that later. However, the job projections in Plan Bay Area are lower substantially than what's in the 2007 countywide plan, again, taking into account the growth in the cities and the county. And this is uh, this is because primarily because the cities have got a lot of additional commercial growth in their general plans because of the desire primarily for sales tax revenues. Uh, the environmental organizations have identified this excessive amount of new commercial development as a real problem in our county. Um, you may, some of you may remember that in conjunction with the release of the 2007 countywide plan, the environmental organizations put on a skit entitled The Da Vinci Plan. It was written by our late county council, Doug Maloney. And eight of the cast members, as part of this skit, carried around scale models of the San Francisco Trans America Pyramid. That is the total amount of new commercial growth that is produced in our plans. And that uh, is uh, a problem in that uh, if that much if that much uh, commercial development actually occurs, it's going to exacerbate the jobs housing imbalance as well as our transportation problems. And I would emphasize that most of the new jobs that would be created by that commercial expansion would not go to Marin residents. Uh, so we think that's, uh, that's an issue that really needs to be addressed in the county. Uh, and as I said, the Plan Bay Area projections for jobs are actually lower. If, if um, you are concerned about local control and excessive growth, a good place to focus your interest would be on your local elected representatives in the cities in particular, because they can control this. Um, also, the local general plans, including the, the countywide plan and the city general plans, uh, do support the idea of expanding the supply of affordable workforce housing and infill locations where there are services, and uh, a, a greater variety of smaller units that would help to meet the needs of, of workers, young people, older people, and people that would just like to have a, a broader range of choices for where they live. Uh, the, uh, 
diversity is important in human communities as well as natural communities. And I want to emphasize that the environmental organizations in Marin have consistently supported the idea of infill housing at good locations. Uh, and uh, there have been some recent attributions saying that it's because of the environmental groups that we haven't gotten as much affordable housing as we need. Uh, but I want to emphasize that uh, we have consistently supported affordable housing in good locations. Um, if you do increase the number of housing units in locations next to transportation lines, then obviously it's going to be necessary to assure that to plan and design and locate these buildings and to, in order to protect residents from air pollution produced by cars and trucks and buses. Um, the planned area does not threaten local control. As Linda mentioned, there's specific language at SB 375 that says cities and counties continue to have authority over their general plans and to approve or disapprove projects. That does not change. And also, we know there are uh, already regional agencies that we rely on to protect the coast, the bay, air, and water. Uh, they have uh, broader authority and expertise that, uh, that is important to protect these resources and go beyond what local governments can do. So we already do have uh, regional planning and regional control. And we do need to have a wide range of resources to address the serious problems that we face of, of uh, climate change and the need for affordable housing. Um, criticisms of Plan Bay Area. Primarily, this has been touched on, but I do not, it does not adequately address the effects of sea level rise. Um, the plan does talk about what's going to happen uh, by the year 2040, which is the plan time horizon, but the Bay Conservation and Development Commission has projected what sea level rise is likely to the end of the century, and it's 55 inches. That is a lot. We're going to have really serious problems. Plan Bay Area uh, does talk about it in general terms, but it does not take into account what we know is is going to happen in the longer term, and it should do that. Uh, it should uh, assess what effects the, uh, the sea level rise is going to have, particularly in the priority development areas. Um, it does talk about effects on the proposed transportation facilities, but just to the year 2040, and it doesn't really talk about uh, the effects on the, P the priority development areas except in very general terms. And so we feel that there is the need to, to have the plan strengthened in that area in particular. In Marin, uh, the environmental groups are advocating that there be a countywide plan that will show with maps what we're going to do to deal with the effects of sea level rise, showing where we're going to, what kind of protective measures we're going to take, what areas are likely to be inundated, and uh, where we can restore wetlands. And I, I just want to say, from the standpoint of the environmental groups, that the emphasis on streamlining CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, in these planned development areas uh, has to be looked at with great caution, uh, since we know that the plan does not really show what's going to happen as a result of sea level rise. And when, when there's talk about, well, we got to streamline CEQA to get things done faster. It sounds like it's sort of, they're sort of saying, we got to get this stuff built fast before it's underwater. Well, I don't think that makes sense. Um, so most important, I think, we need to recognize that uh, we need to take a lot of different kinds of actions to deal, to reduce climate change and sea level rise. It's not just one thing. It's not just changing land use patterns. Uh, or transportation, but we have to do many different kinds of things by local governments and by individuals. The plan also does not deal effectively with the fact that we don't have an adequate supply of water to uh, deal with the amount of growth that's projected. And also regarding the increase in density, uh, it's not enough just to increase densities and locations in order to get affordable housing. That alone won't do it. If you're going to get affordable housing, you have, to, you have to get resources, and we need to talk about that in the plan as well, as well as means of protecting sensitive wetlands near priority development areas. 
So the environmental groups are going to be looking at this plan very carefully. Uh, we have a long track record and we're very persistent and uh, we are going to be looking at this plan to see if these questions can be answered in this iteration or if there could at least be information about how in the next iteration in four years can deal with them because the environmental groups are determined that we are going to make sure that this last place does last. Thank you. Thank you, Marge. Um, now I'd like to welcome Dave Edmondson, author of The Greater Marin, and David's going to speak about Plan Bay Area and, and in relation to Marin traditions and models for transit-oriented communities. Welcome, Dave. Hello. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, a couple of things uh, to start. First of all, um, I... Um, I do have a stutter, so if I stumble over my words a little bit, uh, I certainly appreciate your understanding. Um, the other thing is, uh, I started writing. Um, so I started writing uh, my blog because um, Marin got in my bones, and I couldn't shake it, and I wanted to keep writing about it. Um, um, uh, I wanted to know what makes it so, so special. Um, and uh, as um, I do a lot of this uh, through the IJ and such, um, uh, as we talk about Plain Bay Area and, and um, housing development, we often uh, 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 hear 20 units per acre and 30 units per acre, but there's no context which actually says this is what that looks like. Um, so, um, since I'm also the last speaker uh, to shake you up a little bit, uh, I have a little bit of a quiz. So, um, I'm going to show a series of buildings and neighborhoods, and I want you to guess quietly uh, how, um, how many units you think are in each, uh, um, in um, uh, a single unit per acre kind of scale. So, downtown San Anselmo. It's 15 units per acre. Just the white building. It's 34 units per acre. Uh, it's, um, it's, two, um, it's two units on um, a bit over a 17th of an acre. My home street, that's Forbes. That's six units per acre. Just down the street, though, there's um, some homes that are um, in the 20 to 30 unit per acre range. This is in Novato. It's 26 units per acre. We all know this building, 110 units per acre. Um, Marin, what makes Marin is not how many units per acre are, or, our buildings are, but how they're wrapped in our character, in what makes Marin, Marin. It's more than just um, units. It's context and, and local flavor. Uh, this comes out of our transit-oriented roots. Uh, 150 years ago, there was not much here. We built railroads um, that stretched to all corners of of our county, and uh, we built towns along each of those main routes. That's what it used to look like. Um, each of the main stations became a, 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 um, a transit-oriented town center, what we'd, what we'd probably call a transit village now. Um, uh, each of the smaller stations became um, uh, small little commercial developments. Um, this, these are some of the stats of, of our um, old system. You, you can see some of it still in, in our zoning code. So these were train stations. Uh, you, you can still see what those um, uh, small developments elements were, and they are still there. Um, we are a transit-oriented county, um, even though uh, um, even though our transit system um, uh, was eventually truly ripped out. 
Um, so, so what can we learn from places like this and places like this? First of all, we, we can learn uh, that the, the entrepreneurs who first designed Marin, they did it in, in, in um, a kind of concentric pattern. Station, then commerce, then homes around that. The reason for that is because um, you could easily walk from train to errands to home and back again um, without having to go all over creation uh, and... Um, you could do it all on foot. Again, that's that pattern. See those purple areas? That's commerce. These also show us some of the best practices for what, what a transit-oriented neighborhood can look like and, and what its architecture is. Housing and offices above shops. Um, uh, shops whose doors um, are uh, are deeply recessed, um, and and buildings that are right up against where people walk. There's no parking between it and 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 foot because you got there on foot. This pattern shows itself over and over and over again. So Tiburon and Larkspur, Inverness even. We have started to build a little bit in that old way. Um, um, again, th this is shops below, homes, offices above. Sometimes, though, we've built in a wholly new way. It's vintage oaks. That is... Um, street, and then lots of parking, and then you have your shops. And, some, and sometimes we've, we've done kind of a hybrid. So this, for example, very walkable inside, not so walkable outside. Larkspur Landing is an interesting example of this new style, but in a transit-oriented way. Um, uh, 25% of Larkspur ridership comes from people who are walking. Um, uh, about half of people that live in those condos walk to the ferry and use that as part of their day. And that's compared with just one in 10 f f for Marin as a whole. Um, where can, now where have we seen transit oriented to development elsewhere that is in the old style? Um, so, five, so 505 Miller, that's, that, that is eight homes uh, just above shops. That works out, by the way, that single building works out to, I believe it's 38, 38 units per acre. Strawberry Shopping Center, five units, just above shops again. Um, it is um, easily accessible to a transit hub. There's Rotary Manor. Now, this was an old school, but it is uh, very close to West End, to, to downtown, 100 senior housing units. Um, and uh, just around there, is 1H Street. I love this building. Um, it is old and renovated. It um, is 20% affordable. Um, and there's a cafe that spills out on to the sidewalk. Now, now, just across the street, that's the old Yardbirds. Uh, not exactly walkable on that side of the street, but this side, by the strength of this building alone, it, it makes that... It makes that neighborhood um, uh, stronger. Now, there is a new way, too, um, of doing housing development, but in a way that is um, still frames the street, that still makes it pleasant to walk around. Um, and this is, is um, an example. Santa Fe Commons. Um, 
it's, um, it's senior housing. It focuses, um, it focuses on a plaza, um, and it's there for privacy. It um, is still near shops. It's still transit-oriented, and it gives people that can't drive anymore the freedom to still move around, still see shows, um, still go shopping. It, it gives them independence that um, places that aren't near those things uh, really can't do. Edgewater, um, there's only a single bus route that, which serves that, but what it does do is it gives access to, um, to an extensive bike lane network. These have worked best, these have always worked best when, when they do what Marin does best, and that means um, engage the street when it has uh, when it has had access to shopping when it when it has had access to transit as we move into our future uh, it is imperative that we keep that kind of character and keep in mind that we can still build that way our downtowns um, are are not necessarily going to be set in. Um, well, they are. They are not something that we can no longer build, and we can keep on moving that way in 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 a way that's full of character, which um, uh, is so very Marin. Um, I still. Uh, um, I just wanted to say that uh, I. I, I still write about Marin because other places have done it so wrong, and we have done it so right. There's no reason why Marin cannot still be an example for California and for everywhere else, uh, everywhere else around the country. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. That was great. All right, we have we're right on schedule, and uh, we're going to go to some Q and A, and then we'll go on to comments. And I want to start with a question um, regarding regarding the the greening of the auto fleet, which we auto and truck fleet, which I think we hope will happen. And the question is, does does Plan Bay Area account for a greener auto truck fleet? in its GHG reduction analysis? And if so, what are the assumptions about increased efficiency? Who wants to take that one? I can Linda? Take, I can take that one. Are we okay? Yeah. No? Can you hear me? Bob? She's not on. There she goes. Uh, get, get close to the mic. The EIR, the alternatives, have uh, use a, tra a model that the state I don't know the name of the model, but it's what generates the results, the greenhouse gas results. It's what's used by all the regions for their analysis. And in that model, they make assumptions for every year of every model of every model of car that's on the road, and what the uh, miles per gallon are, what the CO2 emissions are for that model. For every year, the uh, turnover of the fleet. Uh, of the cars as new cars are bought on, b brought in. So that is embedded in the analysis of the, uh, the, the cars that are used. But I, I can't give you the details on... But there, the are, there are assumptions, assumptions made about the techno technological yeah. advances and that the fleet will be getting greener. Thank, Thank you. you. I have a question um, about the, the CEQA streamlining um, piece of Plan Bay Area, and the question is, um, Plan Bay Area policies include some streamlining of, of the CEQA processes and mitigation for qualifying projects. What projects qualify? What does streamline mean? What, how is mitigation handled? And how significant is this to the projects? You want to take a swing at that, Marge? I'd, I'd like to ask Linda. Linda. 
So there is a streamlining provision in SB 375. It, it has a lot of caveats to it, not, not the least is being located near transit of a certain uh, frequency, uh, zoning of a 20 units per acre, FAR, a, a dent, size of a building of almost the size of the lot, uh, and, and other caveats. So it's going to be very difficult for most jurisdictions to even consider uh, enter, uh, the CEQA exemption. There are some areas identified in the plan as potentially able to use that uh, uh, exemption. They'd be in downtown San Rafael and the canal neighborhood in San Rafael. The, the use of the exemption is as like all other exemptions in CEQA are at the discretion of the planning director. So there's a fair amount of analysis, I can tell you, that goes in before it's used using any of the current exemptions that exist. So the local jurisdiction planning director would have the discretion over whether or not to, to actually apply those CEQA exemptions. Yeah, there's no change in the current, uh, current authority of local jurisdictions to make that determination. Okay. And then in terms, let's say a local jurisdiction does decide to apply it, even though we don't know a lot yet, how significant do you think this will be to the projects, to a project? Well, depending upon the project, but certainly CEQA exemption is helpful in terms of uh, the cost of a project and not having to go through the environmental review. It does not mean that a project does not go through the other requirements that a city or jurisdiction may have, such as a use permit or design review, that those would stay in place. Okay, but again, okay. I, I just see it as having very limited applicability here in Marin. Thank you. Quickly, Michelle? Maybe one additional question, maybe for Linda. Um, one of the things that we did with the Marin Countywide Plan is we projected growth out to a particular point, and then we did CEQA analysis around that so that anything that came into a proposal, if it met that threshold, then they were allowed to move through. Is that something that could be done in the PDAs? Um, so that we could kind of hash out what some of the issues might be on some of these sites a little early on? I think that's up to the local jurisdictions entirely to figure it's a uh, technique that the county used in the countywide plan, but I think that would be up to the city councils of the different 11 cities and towns in Marin to figure out. Identify. Okay. Well, and those with P well, that would be San Rafael with a PDA or another jurisdiction if it decided to have a PDA. But, but I, right. I just see that being a, a, a long consideration and many years off. <laughs> okay. I have a question about the Department of Finance's projections in terms of population growth and uh, housing growth, which we know differed from ABAG's numbers um, significantly. Does some, one of you want to speak to that? Yes, this one is mine too. All right, Linda, you're the go-to so girl. This was a conundrum the, uh, that happened with Plan Bay Area, unexpected. The uh, ABAG's project uh, forecasts, as you that I showed, were based on 2007 state projections. Well, uh, halfway through the EIR in January of this year, the state came out with 2012 projections. Five years later. And these were considerably lower than the 2007 projections they had done earlier. Uh, for Marin County, it meant that the state's population projections were 10% less than what ABAG was projecting for Marin County. Well, and that's not in insignificant. So there was a lot, has been a lot of discussion regionally and locally about these two different uh, competing projections, if you will. It's because, in part, well, it's because they use two very different uh, methodologies or mathematical ways of reaching these projections. The ABAG, as I described, used, they began with the 2007 projections, which were higher in the first place, but then they applied a whole uh, economic analysis to you, looking at the strengths of the national economy, the growth of the national economy and what the Bay Area, how it was going to get their share of that growth over time. The state uses a, a model to project based on number of births, number of deaths, and number of people migra of migration in and out. So uh, 
different ways of reaching a number. Certainly, the, the um, state's projections of 2012 take into account the economic recession of 2008. There was a workshop uh, about a month ago with, at, in Oakland at the regional agencies with staff from HCD or from the state, with the ABAG staff who'd worked on this, with the, uh, the consultant who worked on the forecast for the regional agencies. And they all agreed that if they did it today, their numbers would be, and collaborated with the information, their numbers would be about in the middle of the two. So that, and, and everybody, across the Bay Area, people are saying, you all need to be talking to each other when this plan is updated in four years. I think one of the things also to um, emphasize is that these are projections. And when we go back in time, uh, and we don't have to go back very far, and we look at the projections that have been made by, by ABAG and by HCD, we see that they're not always on target. And that's the reason why they're called projections and why, why they go through cycles and, and are reevaluated. Um, I have a question about water in the big picture. Um, maybe Marge, this is for you, Marge and Michelle. Given that state water code requires big development projects to submit a 20-year water supply assessment plan factoring in multiple dry years, why does the Plan Bay Area EIR only speak to the possible impacts of a single dry year? We can answer that. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, does anybody else? <laughs> it's a good question. Speak into the mic, please. Yeah, if yes. you can. Uh, well, this, this is a uh, major shortcoming of Plan Bay Area is that it doesn't take into account the fact that we do not have enough water to accommodate the amount of growth that's projected. Um, so uh, I think the question of a single drought year, that's sort of a part of that whole issue. And as I said, I think that's, that's a change that needs to be made in this plan. Okay. And everybody has to speak right into the mic. Okay, so everyone can hear. Sorry out there. Um, question. How can the housing planned in PDAs meet the same goals we have used to stay within our water limits? And I, so I think this is another question about, you know, finite water supply and how is it reconciled with Plan Bay Area or how does Plan Bay Area um, address that uh, as well as, and I'm going to expand this to, how does Plan Bay Area address um, other resources, public infrastructure, schools, et cetera, and the financing that will be needed to accommodate growth, however limited that growth is? Chantelle, you want, and who wants to take a stab at that? I can take a stab at the education question. Go for and it. I think there are two perspectives as we consider equity and education and funding. In Marin, we have a number of school districts whose revenue from their property taxes exceed what state contributions would be. In several of those districts, and at least one that comes to mind immediately, you would need to talk with the director of finance, but there are significant reserves. Plan Bay Area, while it impacts school, so does every turnover in housing. So does every point of growth. So do projections, which are now lowered, about the numbers of families, about the age of people coming in. The concern that public education is a scarce resource, I think we have to broadly consider Public education is public for the benefit of our country and our community. We have great strength in education. In many cases, we have significant additions from the state, from philanthropy, to support education. There is no scarcity of public education, and keeping it public and supporting our economy and supporting our growth is an essential value that I believe many people have. There's no scarcity of public education in Marin. So to address the concerns about um, other infrastructure needs, um, I think that that is a concern um, at, uh, as far as resource usage, uh, and that needs to be taken into account at a local level. After all, Plain Bay Area is not um, designed to supplant um, the governance of, of, of um, our cities and towns, but um, it's 
it's a plan that um, we can work through. Um, but other infrastructure needs, um, like, uh, like fire safety, for example. Um, the interesting thing about infill, um, infill housing development, or else infill commercial development, is that um, that helps to take advantage of, of those resources that are, and, um, have geographic coverage as opposed to a population coverage. So if you have one person um, in a single square mile, um, that square mile still has to be covered by um, a fire department. Now, if you have 100 people, then suddenly you have a 100 people that are, um, and th 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 that are supporting um, exactly the same amount of fire coverage. Um, same with policing, um, and, same, um, and same with roads, and same with transit. Um, those things are, um, are, are easier to maintain when uh, we build infill uh, in, uh, in a way that supports um, our town character. Thank you, Dave. All right. Um, Chantel, the question is, what is Marin County's character regarding race and age and income? So I think of it, the profile I think they're looking for with regard to, to how, how we break up race, age, and income-wise. Mm -hmm. Uh, overall, and I'll quickly recall the numbers with uh, some margin of error, trust me. Marin is, <laughs> Marin is approximately 82% white, and the balance are people of color. The largest minority population is Latino. In Marin County, the, our aging population was approximately 52% uh, as of the 2010 census, but you can double check those numbers. But proportionately, we are a more white county than any other county in the Bay Area. We are an older county than any other county in the Bay Area. But if you look at trends, in the under 18 population, we have a growing community of color. More of our children, our children of color, speak more languages at home than simply English. If you look at our workforce, while it is aging, the portions of the workforce that support our largest population group are usually coming in to our county and do not live here. Large portions of our public service and emergency staff come in to our county. As to be the sustainable, thriving community that we've been, we need to read these demographics, support who we are now, and plan for thriving and strength in the future. Thank you. Almost all existing affordable and low-income housing is not included in the arena. Since ABAG focuses only uh, on new development, doesn't this disenfranchise people who are already here in favor of new high-needs people uh, being brought in? I'm not sure I got that question. I think no. it's... Um, no, the... If the question is, does building affordable housing here equal new people that all don't live here and have connections to our community? No. Um, we have a deficit of housing need that's grown over time in all areas, not just affordable. Um, for uh, market rate housing, for moderate income families, to reduce our traffic, People who live here don't have adequate housing. People who would like to downsize don't have adequate housing options. And whatever we do won't meet all need, but it will better balance need. We'll have a better match between demand and supply. We'll have a better alignment with projections that are updated every four years around our housing needs and our services needs. So we're going for alignment and improvement, not perfection. All right, thank you. Um, just, one, uh, just one thing. I'm, I think it's important to note that the PDAs or just 
that are located along the main strip, but there are significant jobs in the county that are not necessarily going to be addressed by PDAs, such as farm workers in West Marin or uh, you know other locations who have not adopted PDAs that have significant housing needs, or even addressing um, our growing aging population and elderly people who want to um, stay in place and how that might relate to um, providing housing for uh, families that want, may, might want to uh, occupy spaces where elderly people own a home and could have a second unit on site. I think there's other need that isn't addressed by one plan Bay area. So a uh, related question, why did only San Rafael and the County of Marin apply for PDAs? I don't know. Did, Bob, did you put this one in? <laughs> when, when, the, uh, the, when ABAG put out its invitation to apply to become a PDA, I have to, full disclosure, I was the planner that, that got that email in San Rafael at that time. And I looked at it, and I realized that what they were talking about is if you do achieve this PDA designation, you are in line for funding, transportation funding, which seemed like a good idea, particularly for downtown at that time, because, well, by that time, we SMART was coming. And there was a lot of concern about the impact of the uh, train on traffic downtown San Rafael. So I made that application and was able to sit through the interview, uh, the, the uh, application review process at the regional level. And so not everybody got that designation. Uh, and there were specific criteria that were debated and determined that you had to have your general plan in place. You became a planned PDA, but then there were a number of places across the Bay Area that didn't. They became a potential PDA. Um, and you had to have a certain amount of transit, be a certain size, and certain aspiration, and fit a certain category. So San Rafael's PDA application was approved. Uh, the county also applied, and uh, they did not have the zoning or general plan for most of for their uh, PDAs, but they did have the hope of being able to access some of that transportation money that would be, was promised down the road. And then a few years later, there was an opportunity to apply again, and uh, we did in San Rafael for the Civic Center for the same reason, smart train coming through, opportunity for money to be able to plan and be ready for that impact. Other jurisdictions have thought about it, um, but they decided not to. I, uh, Larkspur May, they're in the middle of doing a, what's called a station area plan for their uh, ferry terminal and the smart station arriving not too far from the ferry terminal. So uh, in order to access that additional funding, they may consider that, but I, I don't want to uh, uh, jump a gun there. It's a, it's a jurisdictional decision, and there may be others that decide it's a good opportunity as well. So it's, it's a voluntary oh, act on the part of each local jurisdiction. And then with regard, just a quick follow-up, with regards to then the, the RENA allocations, they're actually that the jurisdictions are still obligated to plan for those RENA numbers whether or not they have a PDA. Oh, yeah, they're unrelated. And then one more follow-up question on the arena numbers. Um, something that's always boggled my mind is we do all these. We've been doing. Uh, we've been. We've been allocated arena numbers, um, housing needs numbers for a couple decades now. Three. Three decades, and each jurisdiction has to submit a plan that shows we could accommodate so much growth. Yet, does it get built, or, or how much has been built? Well, that, that, of course, is up to the market to decide what gets built. Uh, these, these, uh, there, no jurisdiction has a fraction of the money that's needed to build uh, the housing that's contemplated in a local plan. But the uh, building, the permitting and the building of units is tracked by the state. Um, there are no penalties for not achieving you know, a fraction of what you're supposed to be building. But so the, zone, the, the, the mandate is to create the zoning. Correct. The mandate is not to actually execute That's right. That's right. development. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna take a few more questions. Well, actually, first, let me get a sense of how many people out there wanna, wanna um, speak during comment time. Raise your hand. Someone with better eyes than mine, tell me how many we seen. we're seeing. Raise your hand really high. A dozen, maybe? Well, not everyone's like you, Greg. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, well, well let's, let's do a couple more questions. Um, <laughs> let's see. How can you support, this is any of you uh, who wants to take this up, how can you support the draft Plan Bay area when implementation of the plan would result in 39 significant unavoidable adverse impacts? environmental impacts and lead to increased risk of harm to the environment and jeopardize public health and safety. Marge. Well, uh, I think another problem that is uh, related is the fact that the uh, mitigation measures uh, are not going to, uh, MTC and ABAG are not going to do those mitigation measures. They will be the responsibility of local governments. And so it's kind of questionable about how you could adopt this plan and, and the EIR and the environmental impact report when uh, the, the responsibility really lies with somebody else. Uh, so I think, uh, I think that's, that's another issue. And I, somebody else might want to comment on this as well, but I think that's part of, that's part of the problem also. Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, another question on housing. Isn't most of the housing uh, in the One Bay Area plans f over the next 30 years likely to be market rate or expensive condos? How do we ensure at least some of it is affordable for young families or retired seniors? Um, and, and speak to that maybe even at the, at the local level. Those are locally made decisions. We have legislation that includes uh, affordable housing, deed restricted housing, in market rate developments. On occasion, sort of one of the um, projects mentioned was 20% affordable, meaning the overall project, 80% was market rate, no deed restriction, whatever the market will pay for the unit. 20% was deed restricted and affordability was considered. But in Marin, um, a family of four, median income for a family of four is $100,000. So an 80% affordable unit is a family of four making $80,000. That's a lot of money. Um, so uh, affordability is important. Inclusionary zoning occurs. Uh, we will meet some of our need. No plan has ever met any of the need, and there's no reason to believe that this will meet all of the need, but it's progress and it's alignment. And local decisions will drive what units are located where, what zoning, the inclusion or amount of uh, inclusion of affordability. So this is a broad projection and implementation is influenced at the planning level. Okay. And also... Um, in the mic. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> the, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I think uh, now that we don't have uh, redevelopment agencies anymore, that it's extremely difficult to get the kind of financial support that you're going to need for affordable housing. You're not going to get it just by upzoning. The, the market is not going to do it in Marin to provide uh, housing that's affordable for uh, people of moder moderate or low income. So that's, that's something that we're just going to have to struggle with. Uh, we're going to need financial support, and we lost a major tool for getting it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Dave, go ahead real quick. Um, real quick, um, for really the Bay Area at large, one of the other, uh, uh, one of the facts of a housing market is um, a concept called filtering, uh, which is um, people that uh, can afford that kind of really expensive homes, uh, if they can't find them, then they go for less expensive homes and jack up the price. Um, uh, as as um, a region at large, um, uh, a part of... Uh, uh, a part of making sure that we have enough housing is to is to ensure that 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 we also have enough at the at the top of our market as well as um, uh, as well as some of the more affordable units down the spectrum. Okay, great. While I have you, Dave, question. 
with regards to um, our congestion issues here in Marin County, traffic uh, usually pops up as the number one concern of residents in Marin County, not, not every year, but most years. Um, if you could speak to our prospects with regards to improving public transit and getting more folks out of their cars and reducing VMT here in Marin County. I believe the statistic is something like, you know, uh, 15 years ago, the average uh, number of trips per household was 3.5 trips per household, and now it's up to something like nine trips per household per day. So um, we do a lot of driving here in Marin. So any, any thoughts on the prospects for improving local transit? Um, I think that there is some prospect to improve transit. Um, uh, I think more important, uh, especially for Marin, uh, is to improve our bicycle network. So um, our countywide plan from MCBC will be, uh, if we fully invest in that, that's $200 million, uh, then we could double or triple um, how, um, how many people are biking around. Uh, and you can do a lot of errands by bike. I know I do a lot of errands by bike. Uh, and that can get people off of the roads for trips that don't really have to be by car. Um, and that's where a lot of our VMT um, reduction will be. One, um, one of the other interesting things is that uh, people aren't getting driver's licenses uh, quite as fast. Um, uh, I believe that that has dropped uh, by 30% over the last six years. Um, and um, uh, at least as a nation, uh, we're driving about as much as we did in 1995. Um, so uh, those are uh, our so those numbers are shrinking. Um, as, um, as, uh, as for our transit system specifically, uh, we have to invest in um, um, our ferry, and uh, uh, I know that a lot of people don't like it, but we also have to invest in, in, in SMART as well, so that way uh, we, can, uh, we can add uh, trips to that and we can get people off of the highway, at least for those trips that can go by SMART. Uh, it's about right-sizing our transit system so that people that have to drive have that space and, and those people that don't uh, have the opportunity to uh, do something else. I think I just need to add something. As a former board member uh, on the Canal Alliance, uh, commonly in the canal, you might have a two-bedroom apartment going for $1,600 a month, having three full families in that apartment. That means two parents, a child, or two per bedroom, including one in the living room. Um, those family members working at a minimum wage, uh, paying the $1,600 uh, a month, often are working two, three jobs at a time. So they're having to move. They're lucky if they have a car. One parent does not have a car. They're traveling by bus. And I think that um, the buses really, um, in my opinion, aren't always meeting the demand going from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, them traveling, um, trying to get to each of those jobs. I think if we could relook at raising the minimum wage, I think there are issues around children being uncared for while those parents are working uh, those jobs. I think there is a real unmet demand there uh, in public transportation. So you, you raise the issue that Plan Bay Area is not going to do all things for all people. <laughs> all right, big is there's big issues out there beyond, beyond what we're struggling with here tonight. One last question, and then um, while, while the panel answers this, anybody who would like to speak, either come up, line up at this mic or the one over here, and I'll get to you in just a minute. And why don't you figure on two minutes or less um, per, per speaker? I think you said we had a dozen, Greg. We're, we're right on time. We're doing great. Okay. The uh, question is, um, can anyone state specifically what the greenhouse gas reductions would be for Marin County if the plan is adopted versus no plan, best case scenario for reductions under the plan, worst case, and how was this calculated? 
the greenhouse gas uh, reductions analysis was only done for one Plan Bay area region-wide. There wasn't a separate analysis uh, for Marin County. That it? We got it? Okay. So, um, I had one more question. How will ABAG and MTC accommodate public commentary? And on, if you all got one of these fact sheet, one of these fact sheets on the back is information on how to comment uh, to MTC or ABAG. You can go to www.onebayarea.org. Um, you can send uh, comments to me. I'll forward them on. The deadline is May 16th. 4 p.m. I have someone here who's going to correct me. That's a good question. And uh, my understanding is is that your the comments. Well, in the in the process, the comments need to be responded to. They may be responded to collectively. Yes, in the in the response to comments, that's part of the process. But I also understand from uh, people who have told me who have submitted comments, they have gotten a response back. I don't know if that means just an acknowledgement of receipt or um, a response to the specific comment. And that's the best I can do with that, that question. All right. Ready? We all ready here? We're, how, how long do we have? You know, um, two minutes. No, that's okay. Wait, hey, ho, ho, wait, wait, wait. Raise your hands if you think you're going to come up to speak so we get a better sense of fo timing. Okay. Okay, okay, so yeah, three minutes is okay. These are comments, so uh, you, you, three minutes is fine, and, and hopefully um, we won't crowd out other people towards the end. So if you'd like to start, go ahead, sir. My name is Luke Tessier. My name is Luke Tessier. I'm a resident of Tam Valley. I would like to start by saying that the level of transparency on ABAG is atrocious. The amount of opportunity for public input is frankly a sham. To release a 1,300 page draft environmental impact report and allow scantily more than two weeks for response is absolutely unacceptable. Any answer other than extending the period of time for public input by at least six months is completely unacceptable and indicates an unwillingness and a lack of desire to allow the public to fully understand the horrific consequences of this ill-conceived plan. Plan Bay Area is bad for Marin. It's bad for the people it proposes to help. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for sustainability. It's bad for social justice. It's bad for traffic. It's bad for local communities that want to control their own density and preserve the things that make Marin a desirable place to live. There have been a number of statements that are frankly disinformation. And I hope that they were honest disinformation, but disinformation nonetheless. You are proposing to be experts on ABAG, experts on what Plan Barrier will do, experts on the draft environmental impact report, and yet I see little evidence that you have read and thoroughly understood all of the multi-thousand page documents that dramatically impact the outcome of the Bay Area and Marin for the next several decades. I find it unacceptable that you have not taken into account the dramatic impacts on water consumption. Several years ago, there was a, a wide issue about the desalinization plant and how we are critically short of water, and yet it's not an issue. Suddenly, as soon as you want to have additional housing. Plan Bay Area will almost certainly increase traffic congestion as opposed to remove it. While the main goal of Plan Bay Area is to reduce greenhouse gases, the, the CAFE standards have made more impact and will make more impact over the life of Plan Baria than any amount of planning will. To expect everyone to carry home two by fours and bookshelves on their bicycle and take their dog to the vet on their bicycle or on mass transit is simply ridiculous. 
Can you wrap up, on. Luke, please? So in conclusion, Plan Bay Area is completely ridiculous. It needs an, at least an additional six months to allow the population of Marin to understand what it truly is and to understand the consequences that will go far into the future. The transparency and the level of discussion that's taken place in an honest and forthright manner is completely unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, over here. Welcome. I just had a question. Um, the number that you Can mentioned. you speak more into the mic, please? Yeah, the number that you gave for the rise in the sea level of 55 inches, that's over this, what was the period of time for that? It's by the end of the century, and that was uh, uh, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission did that analysis. Okay, so 67 years, we're going to have a 55-inch rise? Right. That's, that's what they're projecting. Okay. And, and that source came oh, from, what sorry, was the? I, my math is, anyway, what was it's the by source? the end of the century. Sorry? Sir? 87. 2110. It's, it's also, I think it's clarified too, it's also, um, I mean, it's an estimate, a, a best guess, but I think the jury's out on what's going to... But what was the source for that um, number, for the, those numbers? The plan acknowledged a sea level rise by 2010 of 55 Not inches. 20, that 20, was all... 2110. 2110. No, it was 55 inches that I was reporting on, and it was from the Public Review Draft Environmental Impact Report, page ES-10 is where I got that. So that's 2110. By 2110 was my report. And the document, one more time, was what? The Public Review Draft of the Environmental Impact Report, page ES-10. I imagine the that's The agency that somewhere. did the research that Thank led you. to that number was the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. All right, okay. is that, is that it, right. sir? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Randy Warren. I'm an attorney who lives here in San Rafael. Welcome, Randy. Thank you. I must say I disagree with many of the things this panel has had to say, but I understand that they're made in good faith and the result of hard work for which we all thank you for performing. But having said that, I'm reminded of the old Saturday Night Live line, it is better to look good than to feel good. And I feel that much of the underpinnings of your work is conclusory, that there will be 17% growth in jobs, that if we build high-density housing and fill it with people, there will be jobs for them. But what happens if the jobs are not there and we have this additional population we cannot employ, or if that population leaves the area for lack of employment and we have vacancies? We talked about two-bedroom apartments in the canal with three families. If we can move those people out into affordable housing, another three families are going to move back into that unit. And there will always be the pressure for more housing. And we can build and build and build, and there will be no solution. At one point, when you started your work in 1973, Sonoma and Marin County had similar populations. Now Sonoma is double our population because of the wisdom of the stewards who preceded us here. And we must maintain that stewardship because Marin is a wonderful place. It's a wonderful place because of, among other things, we have controlled our growth. Increasing our population is not a solution. It is not a need. It is an end to what Marin County has been. And if we build this greater population and later determine this was not a good idea, we can't go back. We are a bridge built with defective bolts. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If you're, if you're planning on speaking, I'd, I'd love it if you could come on up or indicate just so I have a sense of folks. And then we're going to come back over to this side. Thank you very much. Thanks, Katie. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Bob Stevens. I live in San Rafael. If you don't mind, I might uh, converse with you people as well as you because it's very important. I only have a couple of minutes, so I want to make sure I was right. On Monday evening, April 29th, I attended the meeting at, uh, at Civic Center. 
on the high-density, low-income housing plan that is being pressed on Marin and the other Bay Area counties. It was a real eye-opener. About 300 local residents arrived to hear and over 65 of them to voice their opinion on this very explosive issue. The vast majority of them registered their collective complaints for a number of reasons, including shortage of water, high-density new housing, increased pressure on schools, added traffic problems, property tax issues, and even rising water due to global warming. All were compelling. But the most moving statement I heard all evening was one speaker who said, no Marin resident in this room or in this county has had the opportunity to vote on this explosive issue that will surely change the lifestyles of every one of us. Thank you. You guys hold, 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 hold the The California board. state government, along with MTC, ABAG, HUD, and the other alphabet agencies, has decided what it wants to make us do and is now ramming it down our collective throats. How do they know what we want? The answer is, they don't want to know. They have their agenda, and the Marin County citizens are just getting in the way. Whatever happened to democracy, the will of the people, they know full well that if this was ever brought to ballot, the Marin County voters would overwhelmingly vote against it. And what are our local politicians doing about it? The city of San Rafael has already agreed to it. The, uh, the esteemed five members of the Marin Board of Supervisors have also given them, uh, have given their blessing, and the list goes on. Why? Money for those who play ball. And the decision is coming down fast. I say, hold off for six months, as that other man said, before making this important decision. Believe it or not, Marin doesn't have to join if it's not in the best interest of the citizens. Let's not rush to judgment. Let's make sure that this is the right thing for Marin to do. Thank, Thank you, Bob. Ma'am? Okay, I just want to read this. Um, okay, I'm a resident of Novato, and I learned that our city of Novato is under the control of a United Nations front group called International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, ICLEI. ICLEI is an un unelected private group that your government belongs to. Uh, it operates secretly and makes decisions without our permission. Our permission is no longer needed since the day our city and a few other cities of Marin, such as Fairfax, Tiburon, uh, uh, Larkspur and uh, Mill Valley, to name a few. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, let's see. Our permission is no longer needed since the day our city and a few other cities of Marin became a member of ICLEI. Your property tax, income tax, and transportation tax is paying for trainings, seminars, and sample legislation ordinances that are being enforced in our town. Nevada is one of 500 U.S. cities that's been infiltrated by this group. Every one of these cities is paying dues to the totalitarian U.N. front group. So not only are your federal tax dollars going to the U.N., but now your local dollars as well. This is all part of the U.N.'s Agenda 21 plan, their agenda for the 21st century, a plan for global governance. The organization known as One Bay Area and their plan known as, One, as Plan Bay Area is UN Agenda 21. It's being used to regionalize the San Francisco Bay Area and erase the city, county, and ultimately the state boundaries. Your transportation tax dollars will be directed to favored developers of stack and pack housing. You're losing your ability to direct your elected officials through this plan to destroy local representatives, re representation. This is happening across the U.S. In exchange for the dues, ICLEI brings in activist team to start issuing new rules for you and, it, and, uh, and I to follow. In Oakland, ICLEI officials passed regulations forcing many homeowners to replace their windows, roofs, and appliances, costing each homeowner an average of, of $35,000. ICLEI works to make it difficult to own or operate your own car, using policies that eliminate building new roads and placing higher taxes on gasoline, issuing parking fees, and in some communities, home building policies uh, ban the building of garages and are now even banning fireplaces and outdoor grills. Just a few examples of what happens once your local officials uh, sign a con uh, contract with them. 
In addition to the 500 already infiltrated cities, the UN through the ICLEI plans to infiltrate 1,000 more US cities in the next few years. However, we can do something about it. For example, uh, I need to wrap county, up, ma'am. OK, county commissioners in, in uh, Carroll County, Maryland recently um, kicked ICLEI out of their county because they found that the UN blames capitalism and private property ownership for most of the environmental ills of the world and advocates controls that will eliminate private property rights. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. All right. Uh, over here. That's a tough act to follow. Sir? Uh, my name is Dave Corey. Uh, and actually, could I ask you a favor, Kate? E? I guess. Yeah, well, it depends um, on what it is. I could say no. I know you could. As could I. Right. Um, my question, it says Chantal on the top. Do you think you can find it for me? I, I can have. You know what? We got so many questions. Are you okay. Trying, yeah, All right. I'll try to, to remember go, it because I, I have a question at the end. Um, it's it, it's nice that um, Nona is going to be following me because I think she can confirm that the other day she indicated there's basically two percent of the land in Marin that's available for development, and um, as often as there's a declaration that you cannot upzone to meet housing needs. It's a start. Land is rationed in Marin. And the free market cannot meet the needs of the people here. It does need subsidy, but housing needs land. Needs land in good spaces. I love what you had to say, David that are close to downtowns, and that the people who work here already can live. We need a more equitable Marin. We are a community. This process is challenging us to make priorities. Is it the 84% of land that's already set aside, or is it the people who need education, access, the community's portrait of Marin lays out a decimating, that's not the right word, a bad picture of the differences in access to resources of people of color, people of lower income versus the rich. Here's a fact. More water is used by rich people than poor. So if you're going to go after water use, let's get rid of the rich people. All right, Dave, 30 seconds. Pardon? 30 seconds. You're, 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 you have pauses and you're talking. Go. Okay, Katie. <laughs> um, the only issue that I have beyond this is I want to quote Mr. Rogers. <laughs> won't you be my neighbor? He was talking about neighborhood. We've never said, won't you be our neighbor? We've said, stay away. You have to earn your way here. You have to pay the price. Let's open the bridges a little bit. Let's give ourselves access to people who use resources well, who value every penny, every square foot, every drop of water they have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ma'am, hold on down. Welcome. Hi. Um, my name's Marisa, and I've lived in Marin since, oh, 1966, and I remember people walking to help buy open space so Marin wouldn't become like Los Angeles or San Jose, I mean San Jose. And nature needs land. And I've heard the word wildlife corridor. I, I have to read this 1,300-page plan. I thought it might be here, but I did pick up a pamphlet of a couple of pages. So I, I'd like to read it and understand it and see what does wildlife corridor mean. Is, are there going to be tunnels so that wildlife can cross the highways so that we have ecological diversity? Um, wildlife corridors are not for those of us who follow. They're for nature, animals, oh, and people are a part of that. But we are not the end-all, be-all. Um, Again, I'd like to read the report. I think it would be so great if we could get a real train, not the smart train, having lived in Europe and been on real trains that get people places and out of their cars and take them where they need to go, near housing. Um, 
they can get to their businesses, all of that. Um, I've taken the buses here. I've ridden my bike here. Everything I drive, I'm one of those people who probably makes nine trips a day, unfortunately. I'd like to ride my bike without hitting potholes or getting doored. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to do. I, I, I don't know what to say about the report because, gee, I haven't read it, but two weeks. My God, I learned about this meeting today. Thanks. Thank you. We'll come over on this side. Ready? Okay, thank, thanks very much. Welcome. Uh, in the interest of using the forum as an opportunity to clarify information, perhaps misinformation, disinformation, and to give you information that you may not have, I want to address just one comment that someone made, actually, actually was a question, and that is it referred to the 39, I think 39 or 40. Into the mic. 39 or 40 <clears throat> significant unavoidable impacts that were identified in the EIR. <clears throat> I happen to have written the EIRs for 25 years, and so I look immediately for the flaws, and I find lots of them. My colleagues and I all write flawed documents. The flaw in this particular EIR is that the reason there are these significant unavoidable impacts, and they cover virtually every topic, <clears throat> is because ABAG and MTC have no authority to mitigate. There are actually there are two reasons why they're significant and unavoidable in this EIR, and that is one of them. They have not the authority to impose mitigation measures. That rests with a local authority, which is one way of reassuring you that locals have control, although it may leave you to wonder why are these such significant unavoidable impacts. They have another reason for calling them significant and unavoidable, and that is because they don't know whether the mitigations that they list are really going to be effective. That one poses a real problem for me. I compare this with the countywide plan, EIR, in which there are, were, in 2007, 43 listed significant unavoidable impacts. That means that, in CEQA terms, um, you can mitigate all you want, but you cannot get away from the fact that there will be a significant residual impact in the case of the EIR on the countywide plan, the impacts were invariably cumulative. That is to say that over the period, the life of the plan, the impacts on traffic, and there were about 23 that were traffic-related, Tiburon Boulevard, Sir Francis Drake, and so forth. So uh, the EIR on the countywide plan was, was really honest in demonstrating that over the long term, with growth over a period of, of the life of the plan, there would be some significant impacts. Some of those have been resolved. The gap closure did a few and so forth. So the, the point is, uh, another point, which is that if you make comments, I suggest that you try to focus your comments. It's a 1,300 document, 1,300 page. You don't have to read every page. You pick and choose and so forth. Look, look for the conclusions of, under every topic. But if you want your comments to be responded to, then focus, put them in the, in, in, in the context of the EIR because CEQA requires that the lead agency respond to comments. If you comment just on the plan, you may not get a, <laughs> it's unlikely that you'll get a direct response. Focus on the EIR if you can. Go to the, just the, the, the summary of it. Go to the summary of impacts and so forth. And do your comments. And there are going to be issues. There are going to be cumulative issues and so forth. So. Uh, do what you can to, to comment in a way that will actually be listened to and responded to. Thanks. Thank you for the clarification. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. That's exactly what we all need to do. And, and I'm going to start with what I really should end with, which is I urge all of you to read the One Bay Area Plan. It's online. And to read the summary of, the, of this report, the Environmental Impact Report, because the consequences to us are, are grave. I mean, it, and it's significant. Uh, we don't fit in the One Bay Area Plan. Marin County has been building and living according to plan for many, many years, and that's why we are the wonderful county that we are. We have lived within our water resources, uh, and we just, that's my concern, is this plan doesn't address Marin. Uh, there's too many questions, too many concerns. 
that are not addressed by this plan. Uh, I'm an unincorporated Marin. I think this is where the, uh, the major fallout's gonna happen and the residents that have been living in planned communities like Lucas Valley and Marinwood are going to be given a, a, a planned development area that doesn't fit at all with that. Uh, I challenge the comment or the statement that there's plenty of money in, in reserve for schools. Please tell that to the Dixie District. Do you know that any child going to the district, dis, Dixie schools, which are already overcrowded and people have to bus their children or drive their children to not the neighborhood school, uh, they have to pay $500 per child in order to keep art there, in order to, you know, <laughs> Every, the valley there, that whole area, is constantly giving more money by, by taxes out of their uh, property taxes towards the schools because the schools are not funded well. Uh, the music's going to be dropped out, the arts dropped out, sports dropped out, all that's going to happen and then the school is no longer such a great school. One of the reasons why the planned development area is, would be nice for Marinwood there is because the school is great. Uh, Santa Venetia has already given, and so they're saying, well, yeah, our schools would are be better over there in that Dixie district. The Dixie district can't sustain this uh, development there because it's not, there's no money there from the development going towards the school. So that's a major issue for a lot of the homeowners there because property values are related to the Dixie District School uh, and the excellence. My daughter went to Dixie. I believe, I believe in public school. I, we lived in Sausalito for many years. I'm a 35-year resident uh, of Marin. Sausalito, none of the neighbors in the, you know, of our neighborhood went to the public school. They all either lied and said they lived in Mill Valley or they, or they uh, uh, went to private school. You'll need to wrap up, ma'am. Because of Marin City's impact on that school. So here we go again. There is, uh, oh, by the way, I'm a, you could con call me a senior and I already can't ride a bike. I wish I could. Uh, but, you know, if seniors is, is what the growth is and our concern is of the population that already is here in Marin, biking is not an answer. Thank we, you. Thank you very much. You know, I, I think just to her point, oh. which is a good one, is oh. that the major flaw of the plan is that it's a regional plan with regional conclusions, regional impacts and regional mitigation. So don't expect that when you go to the plan or the EIR, you're gonna get a lot of specificity for, for Marin. It doesn't address a lot in Marin. Okay, so it's nine o'clock, but I'd like all the people who are here to speak to have a chance. So is it is this it, the, the three of you, four of you? One more, five, six, okay, so it's, do you all mind staying here a few minutes longer? Two minutes each, okay? Because okay, that's, oh, or even less. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Thank you. Oh, name, wait, wait. Oh, what, what's happening here? Uh, Let the people speak, my dear. I'm going to figure out a way to make that happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, it'd be great if you could keep it to one. Uh, my name is Peter Lax from uh, Fairfax, California. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Uh, my review of uh, the Plan Bay Area and its touted benefits, I'm a little skeptical because the benefits. Could you speak into the mic more, the please? The benefits. It, to my view, did not seem that uh, that beneficial uh, in terms of affordability. Uh, affordability uh, uh, with the plan, um, people earning under thirty-eight thousand dollars a year would see the, their cost of housing and transportation go from seventy-two percent to seventy-four uh, percent, and then in the overall commute times only going to be a reduction of either no reductions or about one minute um, for most people. Uh, on greenhouse gas emissions, the funds available for greenhouse gas mitigations are only going to be about 0.57%. That's about one half of 1% of funds available to combat greenhouse gases. And, so I'm concerned because I'm not seeing enough of the benefits. And I did want to ask, pose this question uh, 
what are the greenhouse gas benefits uh, if they've actually been calculated or quantified that are attributable directly to the implementation of the plan versus other trends in greenhouse gas reductions. I had not seen that, and I was wondering if anyone on the panel has a quantification of that, either in terms of actual carbon by tons or by percentage as a direct result of the plan versus no plan. Peter, could I ask you to um, send me an email with the, that question, and I'll get a response for you? I'd be happy to. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, we're on, we're on, the, we're on the, we're over here. Sir? Okay, uh, Clayton Smith from Mill Valley. Welcome, Clayton. Um, uh, yeah, hi. Um, first off, I want to say that, uh, in my opinion, uh, Plan Bay Area is the triumph of bureaucracy uh, over common sense. Its top-down methodology is both authoritarian and non-organic, and it is, in my opinion, created, in essence, to enhance social control. Its massive, all-encompassing uh, nature uh, leads ultimately to irrationality and to arbitrariness. Its impact on local schools, roads, fire, police, and infrastructure are uncompensated for and uncertain. The jobs and consequent housing projections are flat-out bogus. It benefits low-income housing developers via generous tax credits, which are leverageable. This provides great short-term gains to a few, leaving long-term costs to the many, namely to those people who are taxpayers and homeowners of Marin County. It sets in motion the removal of local control from the planning process. It takes uh, our elected representatives at the state level off the hook when it comes to accountability for the damages it is going to inflict upon our communities. It supports the open violation of current environmental protections against unsuitable development. It does nothing to improve air quality or to reduce traffic congestion. And no real debate on this issue has yet been held in public. My recommendations to your committee and all those who are part of your movement is, first, we need a Lincoln-Douglas-style public debate on this issue, a real, real forum so that people who are opposed to it have an opportunity, at least as well as you do, in such an environment as this to express themselves so as to open this up to the democratic process. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, we definitely need to have a six-month extension of this uh, time or grace period of investigation. And finally, after we have had the debate, we've had the time, we need to put this up to popular vote. This is too big a decision to be left to a bunch of nameless, uh, colorless bureaucrats. And I guarantee you, if you do this, we will mount a overall general recall campaign to get rid of all the bums that voted for it on the Board of Supervisors and all the county uh, <laughs> local governments that happen to be around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your confidence. Hi, my name is Matt Butler, resident of San Rafael yeah, here. Welcome. Um, want to uh, voice my thoughts about maintaining a healthy democracy, and I, I believe that Allowing the public to show up and speak and say what they truly believe has as much value as allowing folks on the stage to make projections based on what may or may not be accurate information. So 10 minutes worth of uh, number crunching when they may be phony numbers has less value to me than listening to people speak from the heart. And when you take a democracy, the importance of gathering people together and letting them speak their mind is a very crucial element of that. And cutting them short and, and waving signs in their face while they're attempting to address you is disrespectful to them. And I, I can listen to opinions that I disagree with and have my mind changed in a public setting when people are speaking what they truly believe. That, that has happened to me. I think I tend to temper what I say at a public meeting and 
try not to go off on a rage, but I think it's very important that you not get in the way of the public saying what they need to say. It's an important part of democracy, and I have seen ABAG run it over many times. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. All right, thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Sharon Rushton, and I'm... Welcome, Sharon. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Nona Dennis for showing the correlation between the 39 significant unavoidable adverse environmental impacts and the countywide plans, 42 or 43 significant unavoidable adverse impacts. So that although Plan Bay area uh, may have a lot of unavoidable impacts because the mitigations would be rendered by outside their authority of other jurisdictions, the countywide plan directs development in the same areas as Plan Bay Area. And the, and the countywide plans EIR did do a thorough uh, evaluation of the impacts. And therefore, uh, it, they still are serious when development in the same areas will result in somewhere between 39 Plan Bay Area or 42 to 43, as stated in the countywide plan, of significant unavoidable adverse environmental impacts. The severity, magnitude, and number of these impacts are astonishing. And to give an example, in the Tam Valley and Almonte area, this area is included in a priority development area. And in this area, there is unacceptable traffic congestion at the highest level possible, level of a service F, severe flooding. It will be subject to sea level rise where the entire area will be entirely covered with water during the life expectancy of the buildings that will be developed due to Plan Bay area. It is a high seismic activity area. And there is frequent high liquefaction, subsidence, and mud displacement. In addition, the area is in proximity to natural habitat and endangered species. This is an example of an area that is targeted with high density development. It, sh it is a, an example of how Plan Bay area is a failure. There could be no benefit from implementation of Plan Bay area that would override the devastation, suffering, and loss of the significant unavoidable adverse environmental impacts. We urge ABAG, MTC, and Marin County's representatives to preserve the environment and protect public health and safety, and prevent any Bay Area sustainable community strategy from mandating development in hazardous areas. Okay, Sharon, you need we to wrap urge up. ABAG, MTC, and Marin County's representatives to recognize that there is an ultimate limit to growth and to reduce the total projected build out of any Bay Area sustainable community strategy to a level that is sustainable. We urge Marin County Board of Supervisors to work with ABAG and MTC to remove Tam Valley and Almonte from the Highway 101 Corridor Priority Development Area of Plan Bay Area. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Okay, so everyone, I just I want to remind there's only a few more speakers. I hope you'll keep it short. Everyone here is a volunteer doing it on their own time. This isn't a public hearing. This was an event put on by these organizations. So I want to be, I, I want to be uh, sensitive to the time that folks have given and also, also to the tech, tech staff here. Thank you. So, so if you can keep your remarks as brief as possible, I would appreciate it. Kiki, you want to go? Kiki Laporta. I live in Fairfax. And I'm uh, with Sustainable Marin and Sustainable San Rafael, one of the organizers for tonight's event, which was strictly intended to be an opportunity to get real information and give us all in the democratic process an opportunity to uh, form opinions based on fact rather than rhetoric or dogma. So the significant impacts to me of something that we call business as usual have resulted in an unacceptable amount of CO2 in my atmosphere. Air quality that causes uh, the Air Quality Management District to tell me I can't burn my fireplace on Christmas and Thanksgiving. Uh, water shortages and the constant threat of drought. Um, a severe jobs housing imbalance in this county such that 60% of the people who work here 
are not able to live here. And um, I believe that those uh, significant impacts on my quality of life and yours are a result of not a result of planning, but a result of not planning. And I have never been in a situation where there's been so much objection to looking at the facts, understanding the relative import and impact of those facts, and making, allowing the genius of the community to come together to solve problems. I don't think any of us would, would disagree that we have problems that need to be addressed. I would hope that everybody in this room will participate in solving the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Kiki. <laughs> sir, sir, you're up. Okay. Hello, my name is Kevin Moore. I'm from San Rafael. Welcome, Kevin. And uh, I also would like to urge you a six-month extension to re read the ERI reports and people to get their comments in. Uh, one thing, I really appreciate the information that you presented here. One thing that I think really stood out was one minute you're telling us it's all under local control, don't worry about it, and then a few minutes later I hear this is a mandate that's coming down. And you really need to make like a FAQ or a, a, a sheet saying what is under local control and what is a mandate so we really know what is what because we're kind of hearing this flip-flop back on different things. One of the things I'd really like to see is better assessment in the PDAs and other uh, areas we approve the Plan B area does not require an assessment of the impact on local resources, school classrooms, sewer pipelines, not just the treatment plants, but the pipelines. Because if you put too high a concentration of buildings in one area, and you have a sewer line that's this big, and you need one that's this big, well, the first time it rains, you're going to be blowing manhole covers all over the place and have sewer spills all over. So you also have to look at the delivery of electricity. How's it goes from MEA to the buildings? If you put too many, you know, housing in one area, you're going to have to look at expanding the grid. It's just like plugging in too many plugs into one outlet, you know. These things need to be assessed before we say we're willing to put in 600 units into this area. I think that's just more planning, smart planning, okay. The, um, the last thing is it is legal to demand developer fees when a development goes in that the developer has to pay fees to expand schools. It's part of Prop 13. And I think we should make sure that we don't shortchange ourselves for that. Because if we add 600 units, and assuming one child per unit, that's 600 children, 30 children per classroom, we're going to have to add 20 classrooms to that area. Now, if most of those kids are going to be going to you know, one school, we're going to have to look, do we have the land to add all those classrooms? And planning is you have to wrap up, sir. put in you know, portables or start building vertically to meet the demand. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ann Spake, and I live in Tam Valley. Welcome, Ann. Hi. My concern is that I don't think the plan really achieves what it purports to achieve. The conundrum, in part, is caused by the proximity of housing to transit. If we're really interested in an environment that is more survivable, then we don't put people right next to transit because it destroys their health. And we cannot wait for cars to change and all of these other things that supposedly are going to happen while a whole generation uh, experiences lifelong lung impairment, while seniors die from elevated cancer risks and heart cardiac. So I think that this, this is the fundamental flaw in this whole plan. I might add, in addition to that, uh, I think the whole concept of the PDA uh, has not worked because you have not selected appropriate places for development. This was verified by the Pacific Institute study that said 26% of the PDAs in the care communities, which are the most impacted communities already in terms of air quality, should not be inhabitable as residential areas. I think that this plan is neither a job plan or an equity plan. The giveaway on that is your other alternatives carry those names. It's not the environmentally preferred plan as admitted in your EIR. So I think I don't object to the idea of planning, 
but I think what has happened is by narrowing down to this plan, you have obviated the ability of creative thinking and better ways to provide directly for the real needs of people without an incredible list of significant environmental consequences in your efforts to hypothetically improve the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Last two. Welcome. Uh, yeah. My name is uh, Jim Bitter from Mill Valley. Hi, Jim. Can I walk down yes, a little my light? hometown. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you go to La Ginestra and... They did. I grew and up And you have there, the yeah. spinach ravioli and... Yeah. So I walked in a little late and I, and I saw the slide of Main Street Tiburon. And I'm, I'm a slightly very angry because that's my town. I used to have dinner with Fred and Juanita, my dad. He created that little precious place called Main Street Tiburon. We have those all over, all over Marin. That's our Marin County. I think if that's your camera, you should take it out on 580 and you cross 680 and you're into Pleasanton and they're building this wonderful housing, which is the reason we live in Marin because we don't want that. There's a little bit of wealth in Marin, and people have jobs here. I know people in the Canal District. So they have work because there's money here. So don't screw that up. The Board of Supervisors, I'm running out of breath there. I believe it's going to be five to zip for this thing. I think tomorrow they should have a news conference, just announce it, that they're going to do it. There's 17 sites in Marin. The Planning Commission, they're appointed by the board. They're struggling with it, but those 17 sites are going to happen. The board are going to raise their hand, and every one of you should get up, and, and this is a university, explain global warming. Is it climate change? Is it too hot, too cold? We need a climate action plan. There is nobody on the face of the earth in government, in the bureaucracy, who, who can even begin to explain that thing. So do, do us a favor, and the, the last thing, tell us the truth about the, where this is coming from. National Association of uh, Government, uh, count, you know, ABAC. Not realtors. This is a national movement. This okay. is happening in Vancouver, all across the country. They're all identical, they're called 2040, we are all doomed. This is not my Jim, thank you very much. Time's up. Thanks for coming. All right, last speaker tonight. Hi. Uh, Welcome. My, thank you. My name is Pam Drew, and I want to say the highlight for me tonight was David Edmondson's slideshow. I thought it was very truthful. I've not been a friend of his blog. Uh, in many instances, but I find that he has a lot of good things to say. Now, if those, if those pictures could actually show us what will come to us through Plan Bay Area and Marin County uh, by 2035, then I wouldn't be opposed to Plan Bay Area. But I'm, I'm holding this sign here because Plan Bay Area is going to it's going to pass, and it has been going to pass or be implemented from the beginning. And what we have at this point is to be getting our uh, statements in for the EIR so that the legal challenges can occur afterwards, and so that those public servants like Steve Kinsey and maybe um, uh, San Rafael Heller and maybe Bob Brown and um, who else? Maybe Greg Brockbank will get the credit that they deserve for having stood behind this plan and having shepherded it on through all the way. So we will see it and then we will deal with the consequences. Thank you for your comments. All right, everyone. I 
It was really a, a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. And um, I, really, I really value this community and um, a civil dialogue like this. I hope that you walked away having learned something. Um, I know we all have different opinions, um, but I know also that we all care about this community deeply. And so it's important that we, we share our opinions in a collective way and, and have them be heard. So to that, again, if you want to comment on the Plan Bay Area or the EIR, and as Nona pointed out, if you want a response to comment, you need to comment on the EIR. Um, you can go, there's information on the fact sheet that someone's going to hold up here. Go to onebayarea.org. You can send an email or comment to me. I will forward it on as well. I want to thank our panelists who gave their time and spent a lot of time preparing uh, presentations and gave their time tonight. Um, I want to thank the sponsoring organizations again, Marin Conservation League, the League of Women Voters, Marin Environmental Housing Collaborative, Sustainable San Rafael, Sustainable Marin, Dominican University Institute for Leadership, Descom Stud Studios, and Marin TV and Channel 26. Our tech people, thank you. Our timer, Elaine, thank you. And then specifically, Greg Brockbank, Kiki Laporta, Marge Macris, Bob Spofford, Bill Carney, Nona Dennis, Billy Paget, or Betty Paget, and Elaine again. Thanks for your individual time and efforts in putting this together. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a nice rest of your week. What has uh, CMCM given to me? The Marin Community Media Center is a place where I get to be creative. CMCM has allowed our youth to participate in filming community events. Extraordinarily high quality training. You get to meet all kinds of people. I'm more engaged in the community. It really fulfills me. It's a very, very supportive environment. Community media is about us. Community media is about you. Or it's our voice. We are the voice of the people. Without community media, where's the local voice? Where's the local diversity? If we want to see this uh, happening and continuing uh, as such a great service, we need to support it. Support your local media center because you'll be a better citizen if you do. Support your local media center because your ideas matter. Because it's important for our youth. Because it's vital. Because it's invaluable.